Good morning. I'm Ryan Alsop, the uh, Kern County Chief Administrative Officer. I'm here this morning. Uh, typically, Megan Pearson on our staff would be leading uh, off these press conferences. She's not here today. Uh, she is uh, with members of her communications team in Fresno County, assisting Fresno County uh, with their emergency operations uh, related to the Creek Fire. Um, and she is obviously joining a bunch of our um, Kern County fire fighters who are up there fighting that fire. Uh, also in, in uh, leadership positions, helping Fresno County, assisting them in managing through this crisis. So we thank them uh, for being there and their service. Uh, today I've got Matt Constantine and Kim Hernandez here from Public Health, and we also have a special guest uh, here with us that I will introduce uh, to you in a bit. Uh, the numbers today in Kern County, uh, we've tested over 190,000 people uh, to date. Uh, and to date, we have had 31,785 test positive, uh, 31,304 or 98% of those uh, residents who've tested positive to date are either fully recovered, presumed recovered, or are isolated and recovering at home, treating their symptoms on their own. This statistic has been the same since we began tracking this virus's transmission uh, here in Kern County. A uh, couple of notes uh, on the, uh, the governor. Um, the state earlier this week announced that uh, nail salons may resume indoor operations statewide with adaptations and operating under guidance here in Kern County. Nail salons may begin indoor operations today following the state's issued guidance for that industry. Nail salon owners and uh, 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 their employees can get this guidance uh, and this information on how they are, are, are to begin operating at covid19.ca.gov. That's the state's website. Kern County remains in the purple tier uh, of the governor's blueprint for a safer economy. The state uh, updates this information uh, only on Tuesdays. Uh, we'll wait to see where we are. Uh, when the governor and his team discuss this at their press conference next week. Um, I was supposed to have Matt Constantine come up and start this before I did and, and messed up there, but Matt will be following um, uh, me here in just a second um, to talk a little bit about some of the numbers today. Uh, our board on Tuesday, the Board of Supervisors unanimously approved a resolution calling on the governor to provide greater clarity, consistency, and continuity in his administration's directives to California counties, our business communities, and our residents, the board is demanding that the governor work more closely with counties in developing the pathway uh, for increased business activity and school reopening, and that he not continue to move the goalposts on counties. Uh, California counties, our business community, and our schools should not be penalized for achieving newly announced state goals and objectives that have little to do with flattening the curve which, was, uh, which at the start of this pandemic was all about maintaining hospital capacity. A letter uh, with that resolution has been sent to the governor uh, and it has been shared with other counties. A couple of notes on testing. As we have discussed previously, the governor uh, is tying wider reopening of our economy and wider reopening of schools uh, to testing rates in each county. Uh, the state is putting an emphasis on how many of you are getting tested here in Kern County. Uh, we need to increase the number of tests we are doing here in Kern County in order to move more quickly through the state's uh, tier system uh, in order to get more of our business, our, more of our businesses operating indoors, uh, more of our schools reopen. While getting tested is voluntary, we're asking uh, our residents to, to go out and get tested. Please help us out. Uh, you are uh, helping us uh, move more quickly through the tiers. You're helping our business community get open quicker. Uh, you're helping kids get back into school uh, quicker. Uh, so we thank you for putting an effort into going to get tested. There are nine free testing sites spread throughout the county, either accessible for walk-in or drive-up services. And to find locations and to make an appointment, you can go online at kerncounty.com or call uh, simply call 211 uh, to get information on testing sites. And uh, as we all know, most uh, local health care providers in our community are providing testing, 
this includes Omni, uh, Clinica, Sierra Vista, Kaiser, most urgent care centers, all of those entities provide uh, testing. So with that, I'm going to ask, a uh, little out of order, sorry, uh, Matt Constantine to come up to give you some of his remarks. Uh, good morning. Uh, this morning we are announcing 73 new COVID-19 cases that have been diagnosed in Kern County and one new death. As Ryan has briefly mentioned, the state releases new monitoring metrics every Tuesday morning or sometimes in the afternoon. And last Tuesday, the 22nd, the state released information about Kern County. Uh, the case rate, the number of average new cases per 100,000, averaged over seven days, was 6.3. We need to be below seven to move into the next tier or that red tier. It was 6.7 the week prior, so that's trending in the right direction. The adjusted case rate, however, is now 7.2, so that keeps us into that purple tier. However, previously it was 7.5, so we are trending downwards. On Tuesday, the governor and the state also released information about our testing positivity. That's the number of individuals that are testing positive. Uh, that is also averaged over seven days. That was at 6.5, it needs to be below 8%, so that also is trending. Uh, it was 7.1 the week prior, so uh, all of these numbers have improved. As Ryan did mention also, the adjustment though is being added on to our numbers to increase our case rates because of our testing rate. Kern's average testing rate as of Tuesday was 141 per 100,000, and the state's average is 216 per 100,000. That is down from the week prior, which was 150. This is a, a metric that we want to move in the opposite direction. So as it stands now, we need to test about 690 new individuals per day to get that adjustment to be removed from our uh, case rate. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to Ryan. Thanks, Matt. Again, on testing and the need for our community to get tested, I am uh, pleased this morning to have with us uh, Matthew Riley, who is the president of the Bakersfield Condors, who I'd like to ask to come to the podium uh, to make a, a special announcement. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for allowing me to be here. Uh, I also want to thank Ryan and Matt Constantine and their staffs, uh, everyone with the city, the county, um, the health department, um, for their tireless efforts that they've put into to helping our community get back on its feet. I um, also want to thank the media for keeping the, the citizens of Kern County um, in tune to how to how to get us healthy and how to get our economy rolling again. Uh, you know, six months ago, our season was interrupted, and more importantly, everyone's lives was negatively interrupted by this pandemic. Um, you know, and since then, we've been trying to keep our head above water uh, just like everyone else. Uh, I think probably no one has been uh, without effect during this, uh, during this time. Um, so, you know, we always want to do what we can to help the community, and we've been racking our brains with, with how we could do that uh, during this uh, time. Um, as we've learned more about the, the metrics and so forth and how we're going to get back to, uh, to normal, it uh, became apparent that the community needs to do more testing. So we wanted to encourage folks to do that, and in an effort so, um, we, in conjunction with the uh, Mechanics Bank Arena, are announcing that anybody tested from now until November 15th, uh, you'll be entered into a drawing to win two tickets to every event in the arena in 2021. 
Um, so hopefully this will bring some additional awareness uh, to folks and uh, they'll get out there and get tested. It's easy, I've done it, I'll continue to do it, to do whatever we can to, to get people back to work and, and, uh, and, and help, 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 the, help Kern County and the citizens involved. Thanks. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. Riley. We appreciate it. Um, that is every event in the Mechanics Bank arena, not just Condors games, but these are hopefully concerts, the entire uh, season of, of events at the Mechanics Bank, so all concerts, every single event. Thank you. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Let's hope that that, that happens, and uh, uh, please get tested, and uh, hopefully um, uh, you, know, you can enter your, your name and uh, get chosen for that. Uh, we're going to go into questions now. Um, we've got media, members of the media on the line. Uh, your phone should be on mute. Uh, when I call on you, uh, you press star six to be unmuted, and you can ask your question. I've, got, I've been given a list here of all of the different media outlets that are, um, have questions uh, this morning, and I'm going to start uh, with channel 23. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, I have two questions this morning. And I'm going to preface it a little bit just so that you guys understand what I'm trying to get answered. All right, so the federal statute provides for two different methods for you to determine when it's okay for you to release patient data without violating HIPAA. Now, it's been a big question about whether or not public health can release ages and ethnicity related to those who have died of COVID-19. So the first way you can, you, we were uh, able to determine that you guys could do that is using the expert designation method where you can hire a stat statistician, and that's what the county did. Then there's the second method, which is the safe harbor method. Under this method, 18 identifiers such as name, social security, data, birth, um, have to be removed to help protect the patient's identity, as you all know. So under the second method, you could have theoretically provided additional information around the age ranges and ethnicities of individuals who have died of COVID-19, according to the HIPAA statute 164.5C2 with the safe harbor method, which was the second method that I just described. So the first question that I have then is, why did you guys choose to use the expert designation method? And the second question is, do you think the public would want to know this additional information about who is dying and where of COVID-19. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there, but I'm going to have um, ask Kim Hernandez from uh, Public Health to answer that question. Hi, Tori. Good morning. Thank you. Um, it is a good question. It's one we've continued to work through. As you know, with the safe harbor method, if you look through those different identifiers, um, one of the pieces that is really a part of the identifier is the geographic information. Um, and it, it all, it's, the safe harbor method does not permit releasing geographic information below the first three digits of the zip code. Because we have already released information related to zip code in all of our cases, um, that affects our ability to release information regarding those deaths. So we are continuing to work with that statistician. We do hope to be able to provide more information soon. Um, but because you have to take all of these elements together, um, at this time we're not able to release it. We thank you for your patience. We know this is something our community is very interested in. And it is some information that we want to get out to our community. But we need to make sure that we do it in a way that protects the rights of the people who have died and the family members of those people. Um, and that we can get good information out to you as soon as possible. We continue to work on it. As soon as it's available, we will be making that public yeah so I, I guess the question is from the start didn't you think that that information would be important if you knew both of these methods existed and there was a method you could use to release more information I guess my question is why wouldn't you if the federal government doesn't think releasing this information threatens the privacy of citizens if you could have just released the three first three numbers of the zip codes of those who tested positive and or died of COVID-19 or combining maybe a percentage to keep it even more general. If you already knew all of this information going into your decision whether or not to release zip codes, why didn't you choose the safe harbor method to use just the first three numbers of the zip code? 
Hi, Tori. We did. We actually considered that very early on when we were developing our dashboard. Um, the first three digits of the zip code, there's only three in our community. And so with those first three, there's 933, 932, and 935. Um, and so that breaks down Kern County into three regions. Um, that didn't seem like it was enough detail as we talked to our community, as we talked to our board members of trying to get information about the, geogra the geographical spread of COVID-19 in our community. And so that was why way back in the beginning of this, um, we worked with that statistician so that we were able to originally break it down in those five regions that we had originally. And then in working with that statistician, we were able to um, get the verification that we could give out the exact zip code of, of um, the number of cases per zip code. And so that was when we started down that path of working within ex with the expert determination. So we're still going down that continuum. We're working with that uh, statistician in order to provide that information. But we made a decision early on in order to show the spread um, of COVID-19 in our community that we wanted things at the full zip code level. Um, so we're continuing to work through that to see what we can release. As soon as um, that conclusion is made, we will be getting out as much information as we can to the public. Okay. It still sounds like you guys had an information in the beginning, but I'll wait for you guys to come back for follow-up. All right. Thank you. Uh, Kern Soul, you on the line? Okay, uh, Mojave Desert News, Jack, are you on the line? Star six to unmute. Mountain Enterprise, are you on the line? Valley Public Radio, uh, Kerry, are you on the line? Yes, hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, I wanted to ask about testing site utilization rates. And so I, um, I had talked with uh, Matt Constantine offline earlier this week with just some numbers about um, the utilization rates at your various uh, uh, public uh, testing sites. So, A, I just wanted to know what was the timeline on those, or rather the, the time period that those numbers were good for, if it was just for the previous week or something like that. And then, B, I want to know if you have, if you have updates. I don't, I don't know how often those numbers are updated, um, but if you have any significant changes to any of your, your testing site utilization rates yet. Okay, we'll have Matt answer that question. Carrie, good, good morning. Um, I can certainly provide you the detail you have asked for. If you will please email me, I'd be happy to review the date of those, um, the query that we ran. Um, and then I can also um, provide you some updates as you have requested. As we've discussed, all of our sites are operating at or below approximately 50%, where a number of them are actually below 25% capacity. And this kind of goes to the larger discussion that we have the availability of our testing sites located throughout the county, both permanent and mobile and in some of the rural areas. Uh, but we still struggle, obviously, with trying to encourage testing to get us up to those numbers to get that case rate off. So, Carrie, I don't, I don't have it at my fingertips, but I'd, happy to, I'd be happy to provide it to you uh, later. So if you'll just email me, I'll, I'll get it to you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for me for right now. Okay, channel 29. Emily, are you on the line? Yeah, I am here. So I have a couple of questions, but I'll decide which one I want to ask. Um, okay, so uh, during the Board of Supervisors meeting, Matt Constantine seemed pretty confident that even with this new case rate adjustment, Kern County could be meeting those red tier numbers by next week when the state runs their data again. I'm wondering if the, if the county shares that same confidence. You're asking, you're asking, well, Matt is the county. Are, are you, um, I'm not sure what you're asking. I guess I want to. I guess I want to know. I know how Matt feels. I guess I want to know how you feel, Ryan. Yeah, I have very high confidence in uh, 
Mr. Constantine and, and uh, public health, I believe the Board of Supervisors do. I mean, that's why he's our director. Uh, he's got a great team around him, and uh, uh, I think that uh, if Mr. Constantine is expressing uh, optimism and confidence uh, that uh, we're able to, we're trending down and, and meeting numbers, then uh, we share that uh, level of confidence. Okay, great. Okay, channel 17, anybody on the line from channel 17? Hi, good morning. Good morning. Um, so my question right now is, um, you'd mentioned that the average test rate as of Tuesday is 141 people per 100,000, and we need about 690 to meet our testing goals. So we have to nearly quintuple the number of tests that are happening here in Kern County. And I'm wondering over what time frame will we need to keep that number? How over what time frame will we need 690 tests per day for 100,000 people? Okay, let me uh, get Matt to answer that question for you. Good morning. So the number that I have given you is per 100,000. So Kern's average testing rate as the state is reporting out as of Tuesday the 22nd was 141 tests per 100,000. The state's average is 216 per 100,000. Uh, if you subtract the difference between those and times it by our population, I believe the state uses a population of 920,000 uh, individuals we get about 690 per day. So we do need to increase. Um, it is a lot, a lot of additional tests that we need to do, but it's important to also note that every additional test we do helps to make an incremental adjustment to that case rate. It's not an all or nothing sort of component. So any effort that we make to closing that gap uh, will help us. Um, and then just to, if I could, just to make reference to the previous question, we are, we are noticing a downward trend on the numbers, on the metrics. That's a good thing. Um, we've been seeing some decreased average daily cases since the state has converted to their no, new system. We've now seen we're two weeks where we have been coming down. We are hopeful that we'll continue that trend. We don't want to slow down at all. Obviously, the efforts that we put in place, all the efforts from our community and our businesses is making a difference, but this is where we actually want to, we want to try extra hard to continue that. And if we can continue that, our hope is uh, in the near future, we may be able to start meeting that red tiered metric and start that 14-day clock uh, we do watch this closely. We're going to anxiously watch next Tuesday. We're kind of on the border, and it depends on that adjustment. But it's nice to see that we're getting closer. So I just I wanted to be able to respond. Hopefully, I answered your earlier question also. Thank you very much. And just um, just for clarification, so um, so if we do have that rate, that 690 tests per day, then let's say we theoretically reach that this week, then would our adjustment on our case rate be, our testing rate, excuse me, would that be lifted by Tuesday? Would that be lifted by the next time the information updates? Yes, I believe this, the state, the, excuse me, the county's testing is averaged over that seven day period. I'll have to check, but I believe that's the case. So um, obviously we need to make sure that we hit that number every day or higher to make sure that that adjustment's removed, but it should be averaged over that period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we're um, just a quick follow up. I mean, we're testing about 1,300 people countywide every day, and we need to do more. Um, if you do the math, uh, you do the 141 and you uh, times it by our population, that's the number, and uh, we need to be above that, and we're making an effort to get above that. Um, Bakers with California, and Sam, are you on the line? Hello. Uh, my question is about just the hospital, hospitalization numbers. Um, 
I've been noticing that you guys have been reporting that they've been going down over the last few weeks, and I'm wondering, does this, is this really hard evidence that coronavirus is less present in the community than, um, than it has been? Because, you know, the people that test positive, maybe they don't need to go to the hospital, but if you need to go to the hospital, I mean, you might go even if you don't know that you have coronavirus. So I'm wondering if th that really shows that coronavirus is falling, you know, as hard evidence. Does that question make any sense? It did. Um, I'll just say before I ask him uh, to come up, um, most people don't require hospitalization. Uh, the vast majority uh, do not require hospitalization when they're infected with, with COVID. Uh, but with that, I'll ask uh, Kim Hernandez to answer your question. Good morning. Uh, we are uh, cautiously optimistic about the decreasing number of patients uh, in the hospital due to COVID-19. In general, with most illnesses, um, the number of people with severe illness is proportional to the number of infections that are out in the community. Um, so we're hoping, and it makes sense, as you see our number of cases um, to continue to decline, that hopefully the number of patients um, that have to be hospitalized and stay in the hospital due to COVID-19 will also decline. So these things should happen to move in parallel. We know in our healthcare community, um, they are grateful for this, this um, decrease in COVID-19 cases. Everybody's taking this time to take a breath and get prepared. We continue to monitor the situation as we move more and more into flu season. And so this is you know sort of a moment for everybody to um, continue doing all of the things that have been recommended in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. Most of those things, we call them non-pharmaceutical interventions, the hand washing, the distancing, the wearing face coverings, those things are also um, something that will be helpful in reducing flu transmission. And so we know that as we get into flu season, there's a dual purpose in all of the uh, recommended steps to avoid transmitting COVID-19 fall into ways to avoid transmitting flu. And that again helps protect our healthcare system, particularly our hospitals, um, and the number of people who have to seek services in our hospitals. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go back through uh, some of the outlets for any follow-up, but I am being advised that uh, Kern Soul, Mountain Enterprise, Telemundo, KNZR, KUZZ, El Popular, and Kern Radio uh, are uh, not on the line and don't have questions. If you are on the line, uh, please speak up. Uh, and also, if you are an unknown, we've got an unknown number, unknown caller, unidentified. Uh, if you can uh, speak up if you have a question. Going once. I have a follow-up question. So if you follow up questions, if no one else has any questions right now. Okay, yeah, just a sec. So going once, going twice on all those I mentioned, unknown caller. Okay, we'll go back to uh, 23. Okay, so can you tell us how many kids have tested positive and how many had to go to the hospital and did any end up in the ICU? So that's a, um, following up on the kids. Yeah, we're going to have Kim answer that, uh, but we're, she's looking and uh, coming up to the mic now. Thank you. Hi, Tori. Um, as you can see on our dashboard, which does um, have age groups between 0 to 17, that we have had 30, sorry, 3,615 um, children under the age of 18 who have tested positive for COVID-19. Um, at this time, we have not released the number um, of the age groups of people who have been hospitalized or in the ICU for the same reasons we've talked about regarding deaths. Okay. Is there a reason the majority of children aren't affected is because they don't typically have underlying health conditions, which is shown to be a huge contributing factor to COVID-19 complications? Hi, Tori. Like, is there a reason why? Go ahead. Do you want me to rephrase the question? Yeah, could you repeat it for me? Okay, so is the reason the majority of children aren't affected is because they don't typically have underlying health conditions, which have also shown to be a huge contributing factor to COVID? 
Um, that may be part of it. There are probably other things involved, um, especially, you know, from a personal standpoint during this time. I think a lot of us have worked really hard to keep our children separated from others. Um, for the majority of this time, they haven't been in school, and we've worked really hard to protect our kids in particular. Um, as you mentioned, they typically do not have um, the high risk factors that have been associated with COVID-19, um, and so they're still looking into a lot of those differences, um, both here in the U.S. and and um, internationally about why kids may not seem as affected by COVID-19. Um, but, you know, we are grateful that there hasn't been, um, a, you know, a large increase in, in children with COVID-19. All right. And then any plans taking place right now in the public health department here in Kern County regarding how you would approach uh, the situation if we did end up getting a vaccine? How would you plan to roll it out to our community? Have you guys started talking about that considering the federal government announced its strategy for releasing a COVID vaccine soon? Hi, Tori. We, we've continued to be in talks with um, the state public health department as well as other health departments um, near our community. Uh, we are waiting for all of the guidance which is expected to come out from the federal government and then from the state of California about how COVID vaccine will be distributed throughout our community and about which um, populations will be pri prioritized. So um, we continue to prepare for that. Uh, we remind people that this is something that is not dissimilar to what happens when flu vaccine is rolling out um, and that is happening now here in our community. So we continue to encourage people to get their flu shot as we do every year and that we will be prepared um, to to move COVID-19 vaccine throughout our community um, as soon as it becomes available. Okay. All right, we're going to move on to uh, Valley Public Radio again. Carrie, do you have any follow-up? Yeah, I have a kind of a more general question about just how we talk about where the cases are trending right now. And so in Kern County and across the San Joaquin Valley, you know, the the um, case rates and all these numbers really have been decreasing ever since kind of late June, early August. Is it safe for us to say that the first peak is over? Are we beyond that or are we are we really not able to say that yet? I'm going to ask uh, or first, Kim. Or first Kim, wave, perhaps. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, right. understood. Kim's going to answer that question. Thanks, Carrie. That's a great question. Um, you know, if you look at our dashboard and you look at sort of the epi curve that we have and the number of cases, you can see that we have been on the decline since about um, uh, mid-July, late July, and we continue to want to push that number down. Um, when people talk about waves of illness um, and infections that, that transmit, um, we want to be careful about using that that terminology about the first wave being over or that whether or not a second wave is coming. Um, we know that diseases, um, particularly ones that are produced or transmitted through um, respiratory contact, that those continue to circulate in communities um, even if we don't see giant spikes in cases. Um, and so we, we are hopeful about the decline we see in cases. We know that there comes a point where you, what, once you can get the transmission so low um, that very few people get affected by it, um, that that changes the dynamic of transmission. Um, if it continues to go up, as we saw in, in June and July, that you hit sort of this point of exponential growth where um, lots and lots of people are getting it and we have to work really hard um, to slow down that transmission and suppress that transmission as much as possible. So um, we, we are hopeful at what we're seeing in our community. We want people, this is not the time to quit the interventions that you've been doing all along. This is the time that we want to um, keep pressing forward and keep up with all of those interventions so we can continue to see the case rates drive go down. We can si continue to see transmission decrease. We still want everybody who is ill or has concerns about COVID to stay home. That if you are notified or you find out or you have any suspicion that you might have come in contact with someone who has COVID, to stay home because that keeps you from transmitting to other people. Take all of the precautions that are recommended while you're out in the community. If you have any concerns, contact your healthcare provider. See if you need to be tested for COVID and for other things. Um, um, and then um, get tested if it's recommended for you and take all of the precautions to reduce transmission to people in your household, people in your workplace, people in, in, our, in our community. Um, and so we hope to keep seeing this case rate go down. Um, we, we are hopeful that this is the tail end of it, but we know that if we let up with all of the things we've been working on for the last six months, we run the risk of letting transmission increase again. Okay, got it, thank you. Okay, thanks, Kim. 
Um, Emily, at 29, do you have any follow-up? I do. So, uh, uh, Ryan, I guess this is a question for you. If, um, if this letter of resolution is, let's say, it's accepted by the governor and he comes to you and says, you know, what does Kern County want to see in our reopening plan, what might you guys ask for? I'm sorry, if you could repeat that one more time, you're a little low on the volume. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, okay, so if the governor receives this letter of resolution that you guys, that you wrote, and he said, and he comes to you for your input, what might you ask for in a reopening plan? So the board made clear that um, clarity, consistency, continuity in the state's directives that they're putting out not just for California's counties, but for California's business community and, and all, of, all of the residents here in this state, um, are, it's important to have that. Uh, it's important that the administration works more closely with counties in developing a pathway uh, to um, uh, getting the economy back open, getting kids back into school. Typically, uh, these, uh, these state directives and the, the rules and requirements are um, uh, you know, told to us just hours before they're announced. Uh, that's typically how it's been done. Uh, we'd like a little bit of a greater role and, and greater input in that. Um, we wanna make sure that uh, these changing and new uh, goals and objectives that are, are, are coming out are not unnecessarily penalizing, uh, whether it's a county um, or the business community, our parents, our children. Uh, we don't believe that they need to be penalized uh, not going back to school, our businesses not opening, even if it's under limited circumstances. Uh, we don't believe they should be penalized uh, when the governor is moving goals and objectives uh, that we believe um, aren't necessarily uh, directed at um, uh, maintaining local hospital capacity, which is what this was about from the beginning. We think that is the most important. We continue to believe that is the most important objective here, uh, given the fact that this virus is here. Uh, it's not going away. Uh, it will continue to spread. It's how it is managed here uh, and across the state. Um, so we will be, uh, uh, we're simply asking the governor uh, to avoid adding in new criteria uh, that we have to meet. Uh, don't make this any harder. Uh, don't continue to shift goals and objectives. Uh, it is already hard enough for counties. We're having to pivot, adapt, reprioritize at great time and expense, uh, at uh, uh, utilization of tremendous resources uh, each time this is done. Uh, and uh, we're asking for some consistency and greater uh, uh, you know, collaboration with counties overall. Uh, I don't believe that it'll be just us and our county asking the governor for this. Uh, I believe other counties will be joining us and uh, uh, providing their input to the governor, uh, doing their own resolutions and their own letters. Uh, but that is the, uh, the, uh, the impetus behind the, uh, what the board did on Tuesday. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, it does. Um, I also had one more question about the Condors um, raffle. So h how does that work? People can go get tested and then, you know, how do they, how do they enter this raffle? Yeah, so people go get tested and you can submit your uh, proof name and proof of test a couple of different ways. Uh, you can go to the bakersfieldcondors.com forward slash COVID-19 uh, and you can also email uh, uh, COVID-19 at bakersfieldcondors.com uh, to be entered into this drawing. The drawing will take place at the end of the year. Um, can people enter multiple times? They can enter multiple times uh, with, with each test, uh, proof of each test. Uh, that drawing will take place at the end of the year. Um, I understand that the, uh, the um, event uh, industry is... Uh, closed down uh, for this period of time. This is for the 2021 season beginning in January and it goes for the entire year. Uh, we don't know where we'll be um, as a county or as a state uh, going into 2021 with regard to 
what business activity is taking place. Uh, it is uncertain, but this is a terrific, very generous gesture uh, by the Condors organization and Mechanics Bank. Uh, this is two tickets uh, uh, for every single event uh, that happens at the arena uh, during 2021. Uh, we hope that events are, we're able to, to, to get going and we hope events are able to take place, uh, if not at the very beginning of 2021, at some point uh, over, over the course of the year. I'm told that we've already, uh, uh, Mr. Riley has already received several entries uh, just as we are talking here in real time. Uh, so thank you for that. Again, uh, bakersfieldcondors.com forward slash COVID-19, or you can send your information in to COVID-19 at bakersfieldcondors.com. And I also believe that you can simply, if you have more questions about this, simply call the Condors front office and any of those people there that answer the phone will be able to assist you in uh, understanding how you can submit your, uh, your entry. But thank you for that question. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, uh, we're going to go to the Californian. Sam, do you have any more follow-up? All good, thank you. Okay, and 17, I believe, was that Moses 17? Yes, good morning, it is Moses here. Hey, hey good morning, and congratulations on your job. We're happy to have you here in Kern County. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's great to be here. Really great to be here. Um, yes. I just wanted to ask a very quick um, clarifying question about the um, initiative with the Condor Stadium in order to win um, potentially free tickets for each of the events of 2021. So once someone gets tested, are they automatically entered or do they need to follow any type of procedure in order to be entered in? No, they have to follow a procedure. Um, we're not able to provide that information uh, to the condors, but people can voluntarily on their own uh, provide that information, which is why Mr. Riley and the condors organization has set up uh, two different ways uh, that, that individuals who get tested can uh, attest to uh, the fact that they did get tested. Uh, they can either uh, visit uh, the bakersfieldcondors.com forward slash COVID-19 website or they can email their information, their name, contact information, uh, and proof of test to COVID-19 at bakersfieldcondors.com. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir. And with that, I think those are, uh, those are the final questions. Appreciate everybody joining us this morning, and we'll see you next week. Be safe.